as we all know, as we all know, and as I predicted earlier in the week, tax was going to be the sticking point, particularly between New Zealand First and National. The coalition talks are going to get there. They're taking a li- little bit longer than expected. I think um, um, deeply disappointed will be uh, will be uh, will be the people at APEC that Mr. Luxon's not going to be there for them. Um, but the country seems to be bumbling along in the run up to Christmas quite well without a particularly active government or with a caretaker government. But change is on the way. And uh, if you're not inside the Beltway in Wellington, and I know a lot of you guys live out in the provinces, um, and you might come to the big smoke for the world of wearable art, sort of watch a rugby game or something, or to see the kids at Varsity, um, but you really are not part of of what's called the Beltway, um, the Wellington power-broking circuit. There are a class of people, some of them quite reasonable people, whom I know, whose job it is to, well, try and get inside that beltway and have influence and represent clients to whomever is the government of the day. Um, It can be pretty thankless work. You've got to go out to dinner a lot. You used to have to drink a lot, though I understand that's not cool anymore. Um, But what does a change of government mean for those people What happens to all those contacts that they carefully cultivated, all that influence they used to peddle when there's a new game in town, a new bunch of kids on the block? To find out about this in general terms, uh, I'm uh, joined uh, by Mark uh, Blackham, and Mark is from Blackland PR. He's been, well, involved inside the Beltway one way or another uh, for an awfully long time. I think he's about my vintage, as it were. Not that there's anything uh, wrong with that. And Mark joins us by video link. Mark, how are you? I'm very good, thanks, Sean. Very good. All right. Now, is it calm before the storm for people like you at the moment as the coalition goes on and everyone's sort of being shtum and political columnists are desperately looking for new (laughs) typewriters to interview? Yes, uh, it's it's definitely the, um, the... I guess a silly season in some respects, but also the, the the period where people don't know quite what to do. So the bit of jockeying for position too in my business, where people are uh, desperately trying to um, reconnect with uh, old old mates, um, and <laughs> a whole lot of people, <laughs> and uh, a whole lot of people are also trying to ask us what is going on, and you know we don't know because uh, I think I strongly suspect nobody knows. Yeah, this is the this is the tale of Wellington when everyone wants to know what's going on, but nobody does. Yeah, and and Mark, look, I, and I'm not being mean. It's a profession. It's a real profession. Um, but you <laughs> peddle influence, or you try to peddle influence, and you try to get to decision makers. Um, how many in your industry do you think saw this change coming for a start? Uh, well, I'd like to think that all of us did, um, but I think some. People uh, got a little bit wedded to the way things were and uh, couldn't see the the sea change that was going out in the public. I don't think you can be very good at uh, lobbying or government relations uh, unless you have got your finger on the pulse of the public. Um, I, I think they, they didn't necessarily want it to change, so they, they couldn't see it. Right, that's a bit like some of my colleagues in the news media, uh, Mark. Yes, indeed. They, it was the, I mean, they're all, they're all hunting as a pack in some senses here in Wellington. It's, it's not called a beltway for nothing. Um, they are thinking the same. So it's very hard to break out of the beltway. In fact, actually, Sean, it's probably one of the things I, I think about my business and what I like to do is bring the outside world, the real world, if you like, into Wellington, uh, into the beltway. Bring pe- uh, people in to show the, the um, officials, show politicians what it's like out in the real world. Because they don't, they don't get to see it all that often, and I think they acknowledge that. So they do value the um, the input of people from outside Wellington. Yeah. Uh, Mark, every government, every new government begins saying we're going to be better than the last lot, um, and mm. the voters have clearly decided they have because they voted the new lot in. Uh, and I'd say uh, stay after a term or two, the hubris of power inevitably gets to any administration I've seen in, in 40 years. Mm. Um, it strikes me as a journalist, um, the ruling grouping in Wellington, though, in this instance, turned on that pretty quickly and were quite exclusive in terms of who they would give audience to, who would be allowed to attend court and seek the ear of ministers and decision makers. 
Yes, that was a, I mean, it's a trap of any government, as you say, it starts on about the second term. Um, but 2020, the election then was so solid for Labour. They, it was too solid in a sense. They believed that they could do no wrong. They believed that every personal idea they had was actually a public idea. Um, and uh, they refused to talk to people who would who didn't share those ideas. Um, there were MPs um, who refused to hear from electorate um, from from people living in their electorate. Wouldn't take calls. Wouldn't take. Wouldn't read emails. Wouldn't respond to emails. Um, and that's not good enough. Uh, that and that was definitely when they shut down. You kind of knew that was the end because if if politicians don't have their finger on the pulse, if they're not listening to the public, um, then that's curtains. Yeah. Mark, it must be frustrating too if you have a client who is paying you to, you know, get inside the Beltway and the Beltway won't have a bar. And if your client isn't on the list of approved businesses or people that the Labor government will talk to, that must make it bloody difficult for you. Well, yeah, I don't know if there was necessarily an approved list, um, uh, but there were arguments or cases or positions that um, they didn't want to hear about. Uh, and from industries, they didn't want to hear much of. Uh, agriculture was probably one that started on a high with the Labor government in 2017 and then just sort of diminished rather quickly as um, as a lot of its policies came in conflict with the rural sector. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I think there's always a ra ways around it. Um, I don't think you're ever cut out, and I think that the politicians know ultimately that they, they their their votes are going to come from the public, and they need to listen. Um, sometimes they need to be made to listen, um, uh, and that's probably some of the uh, that is a downside of of um, government relations that might be based on relationships. Um, sometimes you don't want to break those relationships by doing something that your client needs done. Uh, like a you know like a public campaign that is bringing the public with you, making them a, aware of the the danger of a law or a pending law or something that's wrong. Um, I think uh, it's at it's at that point if you're not willing to do that that you're probably not doing your job properly as a lobbyist. Yeah. Um, obviously, things have changed, um, but it strikes me now, someone in your position in your profession you might have to deal with this three-headed beast, the coalition of chaos, as the opponents would say. Does that make things more complex? Do you have to do um, more coffees, more uh, lunches at the Bilcott Street Bistro? Do you have to drink more Chateau de Chatelet 1954 to get the job done? Well, fortunately, uh, that's not the way I go about doing my my job, <laughs> Sean. Um, I'm, I'm got of course you'd say that, Mark. You're in public relations. <laughs> <laughs> I like to call myself a lobbying strategist and in terms of government relations I do so no I, I'm not doing those lunches and functions um, uh, I, I couldn't bear it 